Even if you have the best teacher in the world, you're only going to be spending maybe an hour a week with that person, which means all of the rest of the time during the week you're going to spend with your instrument, you're going to have to be analyzing and critiquing your own playing. And if you don't know exactly what you're doing, you could really mess something up. So today I'm going to give you five helpful rules that will help you analyze your own violin technique during your practice. I'm Tobias Murphy, and this is Murphy Music Academy. <laughs> If you don't have a teacher, you should get on that, and what do you know? That's actually my day job. So if you are looking or are interested in doing Skype lessons with me or my assistant, then shoot an email to admin at murphymusicacademy.org. Link will be in the description below, and the first lesson is free. And of course, like, subscribe, and all that good stuff, and watch the whole video before you comment, because sometimes people, you know, forget to do that. Rule number one. All technique must be executed by the joint closest to the violin that is capable of executing said technique. Bit of a mouthful, so let me explain. The reason why your teacher has hopefully drummed into your head that your primary motion of the bow comes from the elbow joint rather than swinging from the shoulder is not just because this looks better than this. It actually has a very practical reason that results in better playing and sound. I've made this point before, but if I wanted to, say, poke a very small point on the wall with this pencil here rather than with my bow, I would actually need a lot less control of the tiny motions that would happen in my hand rather than if I was using the bow because this is shorter. That means that all tiny motions here still remain as pretty small motions here, so I have to, don't have to worry as much about being in control of them. However, the longer the stick gets in my hand that I'm trying to poke something at, the more tiny motions here become big motions here. Therefore, the closer that a particular body part is to the violin that I am using to execute a particular technique, the less I have to worry about controlling for excess motion. So my shoulder is obviously a lot farther away from my violin than my elbow, so if I was going to try to control for all of the particulars that make up a good violin sound from my shoulder, it would be a lot more difficult. And violin is difficult enough as it is. Now, some of you might have noticed that there are two sets of joints that are actually even closer to the violin than the elbow, which is why the second part of that rule is so important that it has to be executed not just by the joint closest, but the joint closest that is capable of executing the technique. And I think it's pretty obvious to say um, I can't do a full bow with either my wrist or my fingers. So the closest available joint in this case is the elbow. Now some of you might not think that the elbow in this case is the best example because even if by my logic you do it because it's the closest thing to the violin that can pull that stroke, it's also the only way you're going to be able to keep a straight bow, and everyone knows that if you keep your bow perpendicular to the strings, you're going to end up with a lot better sound. So it's not just about it being close to the violin, it's just that is quite literally the only way, unless you move your violin with the bow, that you're going to be able to keep a straight bow, and that's incredibly important. However, there are many other aspects of violin technique where this rule does play out. For instance, by a show of hands, how many of you have trouble controlling the bow? at the frog. I can't see you, but I'm going to assume from my experience that's most of you. The biggest reason so many of you find playing at the frog so difficult to control and so uncomfortable so you avoid it like the plague is because you are actually using the big muscles in your arm that are way over here to try to control the weight of the bow at the frog instead of the muscles closest to the violin that are capable of executing that control, which in this case, interestingly enough, are the muscles closest to the violin, the fingers. Once again, if you try to control the bow with the weight of the frog like this with your whole arm, well, again, little motions here are going to turn into big motions here, which is why you have problems with control. However, if you keep your arm stable and just, you know, limit that basic motion to your elbow and then control all motions of the weight of the frog, loosening up the weight and putting the weight back down from the fingers, you're going to have a lot more control because once you get the fingers strong enough, 
tiny motions here remain tiny motions here. <laughs> Of course, in practice, when somebody does this finger control properly, you don't actually physically see it happening. You feel it rather than see it, which, if you want to know more about that, check out my video on how to fix shaky bow. Rule number two. All technique must maintain, as much as possible, the natural positions of the body. Now, this rule applies mostly to setup, but if you don't have yourself set up properly before you start playing, then you're going to make things a lot more difficult for yourself. So you should always check on this. Probably the most obvious example of this would be the bow hold. If I take my hand like this, put it on the bow like this, well, there's my bow hold. I don't have to do anything crazy or contorted with my hand, and it just gives me all of the natural flexibility that I could want. When it comes to the left side of the body, if I just hold up my hand nice and loose like this, well, this is the shape that my arm and fingers would take. So I just kind of want to fit the violin right in there. Also, you might notice that if I just relax my hand, my fingers have a much more broad curve to them rather than this kind of claw hand that a lot of beginners tend to use because for whatever reason they do not know that they don't have to always use the tips of their fingers. They can actually play more on the pads, which makes a much more gentle and natural curve to the hand. If it was good enough for Heifetz, you should at least check it out. Rule number three, everything is a lever. For instance, if you want to get more sound out of your instrument, you want to put a little more pressure into the bow, well, if you think that you just need to take the brute force of your muscles and push the bow into the strings to get more sound, well, you are doing it wrong. You need to learn how to leverage what we call pronation, which is this rotational movement inward into the body between the index finger and the thumb on the bow. So if I take my bow, just hold it like this, and put it in front of the violin, and then just rotate the arm till the bow comes to the strings, what happens if I keep rotating it? The stick presses into the hair. I don't actually need to press the bow in to the hair. I can actually, and this goes back to rule number one, controlling things from the closest you can to the violin, I can just keep rotating my arm, and then all of the other mechanics of the bow can continue as normal. Let's say I want to get nice, good, stable, strong fingers onto the strings. Well, I could, which is what most people tend to do, squeeze the strings as if I was closing a fist in my hand, or I could, as you should be doing, enable a leverage between the thumb and the fingers. So, in a way, there's kind of a rotation motion between the thumb and the fingers this way, which actually provides me a much more natural and ergonomic way of pressing the strings down that requires the least amount of effort and also, again, keeps my fingers in the nice, broader position. Do you want to get better at string crossings? Well, instead of just forcing the bow from one string to the next, you can think of your arm as being more of a kind of pump lever that sort of rocks the string back and forth as needed. Rule number four. All motions must be as simple as possible and divest from the use of any unnecessary muscles. I covered this a little bit in my shaky bow video. Again, plugging that one, go watch it. But one of the things that often plagues people's bow arms is tension through here, and through here. The only thing that needs to happen in a bow stroke is for the bow to essentially move perfectly horizontally across the strings. Anything that causes any up or down variation usually results in what we call shaky bow or unnecessary bow skittering, even when the person is trying to do a nice slow controlled bow. The primary cause of this bouncing is, of course, people often getting this muscle involved which ends up raising the arm a little bit, which is something that is not necessary to complete a bow stroke. So when I work with my students, one of the big things I always go through with them on is how to essentially eliminate all unnecessary motion within the bow stroke. To go over to the left side, sometimes you see people shifting like this. They give a little bit of give in their wrist joint, where the most simple way of shifting would be just to move the entire arm like so, and this also produces the cleanest and most reliable shifting as well. 
You see, the thing is, if you use any other muscles than what is absolutely required to execute a particular technique, then you are adding another variable of control, another thing that you have to account for if you want that particular thing you're doing to come off with a good sound and without a hitch. And not only are those extra muscles and motions just other variables that have to be accounted for, but often they are either the production of or produce unnecessary tension in places that often cause people pain when they play the violin. And, well, we just don't want any of that. As a teacher, I often tell my students that my primary goal is actually to get you to do less and get, well, not just the same results, but even better ones. The simpler the motion, the better. Now, the fifth and final rule is all motions must be independent and not influence others. Now, if you're wondering what I mean by this, the best example of this would be, well, the stuff you do with your left hand influence what you do with your right hand or vice versa. Can you play very quietly with a very intense vibrato? Or can you play very loudly with a very slow vibrato? Some of you watching may have thought that that doesn't seem like a particularly difficult thing to do, but if you played violin for even a few years now, you've probably run into the problem of trying to split your two hemispheres into two separate operating systems that just so happen to be running at the same time. Now, the vibrato example is probably the most obvious, where if I use a heavy bow, I want to use a heavier vibrato, and if I use a light bow, I want to use a much lighter vibrato, maybe a slow vibrato, and that is the thing I see most often. However, there are other examples where what you're doing in the left hand influences the right and vice versa. One interesting example that I've often found is everyone's pretty scared, not very comfortable using their fourth finger, and so very often people end up with this kind of either shaky or very wispy sound of their fourth finger that actually has nothing to do with their fourth finger being weak or not being properly used. It has to do with they have this fear of using the fourth finger, so the tension and nervousness of the fourth finger ends up going into the bow, and then they do not approach the bow on the strings as if they were just playing an open string, which, by the way, is how you want to approach everything. A similar example is sometimes people get real nervous about playing up in higher strings, and so, again, they do not approach the bow the same way they do in lower strings. You should approach how you play up on high the same way you would as if you were playing just plain old open strings. The only difference is the fingers are up here. Now, the best way to go about fixing this problem is just practice your music using only one hand at a time. So you'll go through one and do everything as you would with just your left hand, and then you'll go through and play everything on just open strings with the bow. Then the next step, once you feel pretty comfortable with both of those, is just mentally to think, I'm just going to happen to be doing both of these at the same time. A few rounds of this usually helps fix the problem. However, it doesn't just stop there between these hemispheres. You actually need to be in much more control of every single joint and have it have kind of a mind of its own. Another big example for me would be being able to separate the vibrato motion from the finger action. One of the true signs that someone is a very sophisticated or well-trained violinist is that they are able, even if they choose not to, do a constant vibrato, even on faster notes. And the way you go about doing this is you don't actually approach your vibrato as if I'm going to put vibrato on every single note. You just have the vibrato going and also have the fingers moving at the same time. Those of you who are still stuck with, I put a note down, I vibrate it, put a note down, I vibrate it, are going to have very delayed and slow vibrato that is really only going to be heard on longer notes. And that can often throw off the tone color that you're trying to get in a particular piece of music. Therefore, the key, again, is to have this and this be essentially two separate motions that just so happen to be going on at the same time. <laughs> Going over to just the bow side of things, one of the most difficult motions for people to truly isolate is the wrist motion. And this is partially because if you only use your wrist, this happens. People just generally don't like doing that. However, in order to learn basically most 
complicated bowing techniques, you're going to need to have complete control of your wrist even if you aren't going to use it in isolation. It's usually used in pair with the fingers so the bow stays straight. However, it becomes very difficult to teach people this because you have to break them of the innate desire to not have the bow go crooked while they're practicing. Anyway, these have been my five fundamental rules for a violin technique. Follow these when you're analyzing your own practicing and you should be in pretty good shape. There is though one exception. Any type of rapid up bow staccato, you just, you just do that any way you can get away with it. In any case, I do hope that these will help you in your pursuit of violinistic excellence because there is, of course, no pleasure in mediocrity. I've been Tobias Murphy for Murphy Music Academy. Happy practicing, and I'll see you next time.